Come on in. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about my Survivor 46 preseason cast assessment. You can throw everything you think you know about Survivor 46 out the window. I've got your winner picks, your first boot picks, and your everything in between picks here just in time for your preseason Survivor drafts. As longtime fans of this channel know, I never miss. If you haven't seen my cast assessment before, I do things slightly differently. I'll look at each member of the cast, go over their background and bio, carefully analyze their words, demeanor, and strategy, and then explain how I think they'll perform on Survivor 46. Along the way, I like to give out an award to each player, too. It's high school superlatives survivor style. Most likely to win, most likely to overplay, etc, etc. Then at the end of the season, I'll come back to this analysis to see how right or wrong, often wrong, I was. Throughout this cast assessment, I'll be using the official cast bios and Mike Bloom's interviews for Parade.com as the basis of my judgment. As always, please go give him some clicks. The link is in the description. We've got 18 new players to get to, so let's get going. All that said, let's dig into my Survivor 46 preseason cast analysis. Let's begin the cast assessment with the Green Sega tribe. And let's not start with my first boot pick, that will come later. But with my pick for fan favorite, 31 year old musician, Ben Katzman. It's hard to hear this guy speak and not love him. A guitar teacher who was a former touring musician. He says he lost sight of himself chasing status in the music world in his 20s, quit everything, and then a few years ago started teaching guitar at a friend's music school. If I could describe Ben in a word, it's sincere. This guy uses shred as a verb, noun, adjective, adverb, and I think it would be easy for Ben's rocker shtick and talking about shredding to get tired if he was cynically playing a role. But Ben's so earnest that it's just incredibly charming. He's a huge character, but he's not playing a character. He'll be that rare person on Survivor where everyone, casual audience, the hardcore audience, everyone likes him. I'd be really surprised if he doesn't make merge. He'll have no trouble making friends on his tribe, and I think he'll probably be the best connected person here. I feel like all roads will lead back to him early on. This is the kind of ally where you find an advantage and you're just so comfortable with him that you share it. I do think Ben will land more on the social player side of things than strategic, and like Caleb in 45, I think the charm will be just too threatening down the stretch, and he probably tops out at around a 7th or 8th place finish, but he will shred every step of the way. Did I use that right? Let's move on to 31 year old retail manager Jem Hussein Adams, who I am awarding most likely to overthink themselves out of the game. I just want to grab Jem and tell her she's way, way overthinking this, and it could be her downfall. Jem spent the first 19 years of her life in Guyana, South America, before moving to the United States. She's worked her way up from seasonal retail associate to managing multiple stores for a clothing company. She's used to taking risks. She's used to being in charge. She's got a great personality and good vibes and should go far, but I just really feel like she's going to get in her own way. She repeatedly mentions playing this gigantic, bold, game-changing game, and I just don't think that's something you can force. Do you want to accidentally vote yourself out? This is how you accidentally vote yourself out. I mean, quote, I want brand new moves. I want things that you would never imagine. Well, Zane tried things I never would have imagined, and if I haven't imagined it, it's probably because it's not a good idea. Don't get me wrong, as a viewer and commenter on this show, I love people who want to play like this. No matter which way it goes, I win. But if she does play the way she says she will, I do see Jem overplaying her hand early, and even if she pulls off a pre-merge blindside or two, she's unlikely to stay golden for too long. Next, let's look at 25-year-old law student Charlie Davis, who I am regretfully awarding most likely pre-merge superfan flameout. I like Charlie a lot, but I don't 
think he's long for this game. Charlie's got an eclectic mix of hobbies. He's a long distance runner, swifty, and law student, but try not to hold any of that against him. Like a lot of this cast, he found Survivor during the pandemic, but from what I gather, he's a pretty big fan and is quite knowledgeable about the show. I think in terms of pure game savvy, moving the chess pieces, he's probably one of the smartest players this season. Here's my issue. Like a lot of New Era players, Charlie is young and seems young on a tribe where everyone else has had a lot of life experience. As I've said before about players like this, this is not his fault, but it will be his problem in the game. He also kind of gives off Spencer vibes, a person he compares himself to. There's just this slight tinge of arrogance to Charlie, which he should be arrogant. He's super successful in real life, but on Survivor, on this tribe, the down to earth vibes tribe, that is dangerous. He's got this strategy where he wants to be really aggressive at tribal council and call people out, force them to name names when they're being vague, which I just think is rarely a good idea, especially with this group. I do think Charlie tops out at this kind of perpetually on the ropes Charlie Brown style character. I really struggle to ever see him in any sort of power position. Probably first or second out of this tribe, but outside chance he could Spencer it and go deep. Let's just hope he doesn't follow the rest of Spencer's trajectory. Moving on, let's look at 47 year old parenting coach Maria Shrime Gonzalez, who I'm awarding most likely to be underestimated. Maria is a low-key threat that I think will be foolishly underestimated in this game. She's a super tough woman, she's a former salsa dancer and Miss February in a salsa vixen calendar, which I have to assume in a salsa dancing calendar, February is the most competitive month. She was also a physical therapist for Broadway shows, she's ran marathons, and she birthed three children at home without medication. I feel really good about Maria's chances, honestly. She's lived such an interesting life and has this really youthful bubbliness that I think she'll be able to use to connect with the younger people on her tribe. I could definitely see her and Tim or Mariah in an alliance together. Mostly, I'm just hoping she doesn't get saddled with the mom role. That's so often a burden and Maria has such fun potential, I'd hate to see that. I do think she's going to be able to make connections early. I think she's someone people will naturally feel comfortable around. And I get the sense that, like Ben, she'll be pretty well connected on this tribe. I guess there's always an outside chance that if this tribe is performing poorly, she could be an early boot just on demographics. She is the oldest person this season, after all. Maria has this big game planned. She wants to go on journeys and get advantages, which I do think is a bit of a red flag. But then again, I just think she's so pleasant and good hearted that a lot of the tribe wouldn't feel threatened by that. Think Jamie from Survivor 44. What I think Maria needs is someone to kind of rein her in just a little, someone who can be the thinker while she's the talker and she can go far. Honestly, maybe her and Charlie? I'm feeling a mid-game placement with finalist upside. Next, let's look at 30-year-old college coach Tim Spicer, winner of most likely to be the class clown. I love Tim. This guy is very funny. He has had not one, but two eye injuries, including accidentally gluing his eye shut for two weeks. And then he says the player he will play most like is Shamar a guy who was medevaced for an eye injury. Honestly, best who will you play like answer of all time. Tim's a family man who helps underprivileged kids get into college. He helps them distinguish themselves on applications and guides them towards success. I think on paper, Tim is an ideal candidate for Survivor. Smart, athletic, charming, a coach, a guy who's accomplished, but who will simultaneously feel relatable to everyone. His strategy is sound, too. He wants a ride or die, but he wants to poach that person from the bottom. He's eager to find advantages, but not so eager it will be detrimental to his game. I do think Tim's here to win and willing to adjust his pace fast or slow as need be. My only trepidation with Tim is that he's a very over-the-top person. He just naturally speaks at a really high decibel level, and he's got this goofy, kinda perma-stoned energy that could be a bit of a double-edged sword if his tribe's growing weary of living with a cartoon character. 
If Tim can turn that off on the off days, I think he'll be good. Overall though, I think this is a good tribe draw for Tim. He's more good vibes on the good vibes tribe. Unlike his eyeball idol Shamar, you can pretty confidently mark this guy down as making the merge. Rounding out the green tribe, let's look at 28-year-old program coordinator Mariah Gaynor, who I'm giving the award for most likely to be a secret challenge beast. It's easy to look at Mariah and think she's just another pre-merge survivor geek. She works in local government, she brews her own beer, she plays D&D. Those are literally the three geekiest things you can do. Anyway, I'm actually feeling pretty good about her chances on Survivor. She'll be low-key good in the challenges. She's been 3D printing puzzles and practicing word scrambles. She's ran a marathon. And it appears she was on Wipeout a few years ago and won, I think? This is the smallest tribe physically, and I think Mariah will be pretty valuable in the early game challenges for them. And if she makes it to the merge, I could totally see her winning individual immunity a time or two. What makes me more confident in Mariah is that she's both analytical and social. In her day job, she's making Google Sheets all day, but there's also a huge element of politicking in politics, obviously. You have to be both facts-based and emotionally manipulative at the same time, and I really get that Mariah has mastered that art. She says she'll play hard and take big swings, but only when they're necessary. A lot of players here want to tick the survivor checklist, but Mariah wants to take things day by day, set up the pieces on the board to her liking, but she won't be afraid to get dirty if her back is against the wall. I'm anticipating a pretty deep run for Mariah, and at least one Parks and Rec reference in confessional. Let's move on to the purple Yanu tribe with 41-year-old IT analyst Banu Gopal, winner of the award for most heartbreaking pre-merger. If anyone's getting the sad Sari music when they leave, it's Banu. Banu's been in IT for over a decade and came to the US from India in 2013 on a work permit. He met his now husband and got married. His husband is a Survivor superfan and introduced him to the show via Survivor Kageyan. Banu's clearly been through a lot in life. He grew up poor and on the streets. When he says he's already lived Survivor, he actually means it. I think it's easy to draw comparisons to Nasir, and it's not just from their similar backgrounds. Banu has this infectious positivity to him, just like Nasir, and he's probably the most enthusiastic player this season. He has so much energy, which makes him stand out so much that I feel like he is in a lot of trouble if Yanu goes to Tribal Council early. Banu's strategy going into the game is to just ride the wave early on and go where the game takes him. It seems like he wants to play a little more passively, which I'd say is smart if I believed it. This guy is a human hummingbird. He has Sifu levels of energy and you're telling me he's just going to lay back and ride the wave? I don't see it. Banu is going to be up early looking for idols, and his tribe will probably notice. Unfortunately, I think Banu is probably one of the earlier boots from this tribe, and if he goes far, it's probably as a loyal number for a more strategic player. Let's move on to 28-year-old salon owner Kenzie Petty, who I am awarding most likely to be hated by the Facebook audience. This is a compliment, by the way. Confident to the point of cockiness, woo-woo vibes, and super into Survivor's diversity initiative, Kenzie is your average Facebook commenter's worst nightmare. Again, I think she's great, but if any of this makes air, the casual audience is going to despise her, and she could not care less. Kenzie's a hairstylist who says her daydream was always either to open her own salon or marry an old, rich, dying man. Guess she went with the former and opened her own salon. She's another person who came to Survivor during the pandemic, when she went to her psychic's apartment to borrow some toilet paper and Survivor was on, and that's how she got into it? What the f***? Uh, well, that's what it says. I'll be honest, I'd be shocked if Kenzie doesn't go far. I think she's going to be an incredibly dangerous player in this game. As a hairstylist, she's just naturally charismatic and socially savvy. She's smart, she's confident, but she's gonna play dumb. We just saw Jam Jam run the same playbook very successfully. She wants to trust her gut in the game, and I do get the feeling she has good game sense and is willing to take risks, but she's not so bogged down with survivor trivia and minutia that she'll overthink things. Kenzie is someone everyone in this game should be afraid of, but they probably won't be. 
until she snips them like a split end. Next, let's look at 29-year-old real estate broker Q Burdett, most likely to have already punched his ticket to the merge. You look at Q and you wonder where things could go wrong. Probably the most athletic guy here, but also a guy with a lot of charisma, vulnerability, and heart. Things would have to go sideways for Q to go out early. Q grew up as one of 17 kids in Mississippi. Dude's dad was trying to start his own survivor season at home. Q says they didn't have any money, and you can tell this guy came from hardship. His shirt doesn't even have buttons. He got an athletic scholarship to go to college, got his master's, and is now a real estate agent. At one point, the number two agent in the country. Q is another pandemic survivor fan who was introduced by his spouse, and his strategy is going to be to surround himself with the biggest physical competitors in the game. He wants to run the oops all meat shield strategy. Think Jeremy Savage and Joey Amazing in Survivor Cambodia. He and Hunter have been making eyes at each other preseason, so I wouldn't be surprised for them to link up later on. Look, Q's game isn't exactly setting my world on fire. He wants to play this old school game where he gets his starting tribe to the end, maybe picking up a few other strong people at the merge. I could see that happening, but I do think when he hits the merge, he's going to be one of the bigger targets. He's just one of those guys where he very visibly has the whole package, and someone's going to want to take him out sooner rather than later. Savvier players will probably use him as their own meat shield and dump him when the time is right. Next, let's go to 37-year-old software engineer Jess Chong, who I'm giving most likely to be first boot or the winner. Good news for Jess is that I gave this to D last season, so the odds are in her favor. Jess is a software engineer at a startup making a program that is like Notion meets Canva, and it's, quote, really fun to use. I'll have to take her word for it. She's had several different careers, but went to coding boot camp in 2015 after making websites as a kid. Like several players this season, she was introduced to Survivor via her spouse, which she initially thought was super geeky, but eventually came to understand that Survivor super fans are really cool. Right? I really like Jess's energy. She's sincere and goofy without being this over-the-top caricature. She seems like a normal person you'd meet in real life and just really like. I'm torn on Jess because I do think the social game is there. I think she's someone who pretty easily draws you in, and I could definitely see her aligning with Kenzie or Tiffany. But she does have this sort of erratic quality to her speech that could make her seem flighty to allies. She compares herself to Fabio of all people, and I actually see it. He was such a goof that no one took him seriously early on, which put him at risk early, but was a benefit later. Overall, I lean more towards longevity with Jess than not. I'm kind of expecting the three women on this tribe to align, but I do think she could be one of the names thrown around if this tribe goes to tribal in the first or second round. She has what it takes to win, but she's got to get out of the early game first. Next, let's look at 21-year-old slot machine salesman David Jelinski, who I'm awarding most likely to think they're the mastermind. This guy reminds me of Will Wall, and it's not just the shockingly deep voice. Jelinski is a young guy who wants to make his mark on Survivor. He wants to earn respect by making big moves, and he will think he's running the show until he learns the hard way that he's not. Jelinski comes to Survivor via Big Brother, which he was a big fan of. He gave Survivor a shot after seeing ads for it on Paramount Plus and quickly realized it's five times as interesting with a third of the time investment. So he's smart and knows how to budget his time. It sounds like he had a rough upbringing. Both his parents are addicts. So at some points in his adolescence, he had to parent his parents. In real life, it seems like he's an empathetic and really kind guy. In psych evals, he was specifically told it's going to be hard for him to win the game because of that. I'd agree, but... Not for those reasons. Jelinski is self-admittedly arrogant. He admires bold, flashy plays. He's a Russell fan. In his interviews, he says he's winning about a dozen times and will play a perfect game. I admire the confidence, but to quote a Survivor legend, this game is going to smack Jelinski in the chops. I think Jelinski will think he's running the show, he'll think he's the mastermind, and he'll probably overplay his hand almost immediately. The women on this tribe in particular are going to eat him alive. Nevertheless, he'll be incredibly entertaining the three episodes he's on this season.
Let's finish off purple with 33-year-old visual artist Tiffany Nicole Irvin, least likely to control her threat level. You know, I'd bet on Tiffany going far, and it's not just because she's in literally every promo and commercial for this season, although that helps. An artist who's worked with big brands and had her art shown in Madison Square Garden, Tiffany is just someone who does things her way, and it tends to work out. Her friends call her God's favorite because things always work out for her. Jersey has a good track record on Survivor, and I don't expect Tiffany to break that streak. I definitely see bits of Michelle, Lindsay, and Natalie in her. She's gonna be a social butterfly, but also someone who tells it like it is. I think she's someone where you'll probably know where you stand with her at all times, for better or worse. Strategically, she says she's willing to jump ship and make big moves, but they'll be motivated. She wants to find advantages, but not so much it'll nuke her game. I think Tiffany's gonna be extremely well-connected, probably the most well-connected person on this tribe, but just too overt a threat to slip through the cracks like she wants. I'm not really worried about her in the early game, but down the stretch, I wonder how well Tiffany can hide the Tiffany-ness, you know? I think she's also got this little impulsive streak that she just won't be able to resist at some points, which could get her in trouble. I just think she's someone who sort of tops out at a final six, final five spot. She's just too overtly threatening. Overall, probably one of our major players of the season, possibly the final boss, but a player whose brush with greatness will be cut just short. Moving on to the Nami tribe, we have my pick for the first boot. 41-year-old aerospace tech Randon Montalvo. Not exactly your typical first boot, but if anyone is going to overplay their way out of the game on day three, it's Randon. I mean, he made it easy for me. Not even his wife and daughter believe in him. He says they're fully expecting him to be the first one out and will even have a first boot party for him when he gets home. Lots of players want to channel Boston Rob or Parvati or Sari. Only Randon is out here channeling Wendy Jo when she says not even her husband believes in her. So Randon's a technical consultant for a telecom company and works part-time for the Air Force fixing aircraft. He was in the foster care system as a kid, another guy who had a tough childhood. He's an introvert who forced himself to be an extrovert because he felt so invisible. I like him a lot. I just hate to say I have trouble seeing Randon fitting in with this group. He even acknowledges that the social side of things is stacked against him. He's a little rough around the edges, he's kind of got this tough guy exterior, and I just wonder who on his tribe he will connect with. On top of that, he intends to play a really risky, bold game where he's going on these journeys, hunting for idols, and I don't think he'll be shy about it. I just don't know if having the rough exterior of Roxroy and the reckless overplaying of Sabaya is a winning combo, you know? I think if Randon can just chill for a bit and hope his tribe misses the first few tribals, he can build the bonds he needs to, then go idol hunting. But otherwise, he may be having that your number one party with his family soon. Moving on, let's look at 35-year-old email marketing specialist Liz Wilcox, who I think is most likely to be a pleasant surprise. I think a lot of people are writing Liz off preseason over a perceived overt extroversion. It kind of reminds me of Drew last season, where many, myself included, just dismissed him as a pre-merger for his preseason arrogance. I'm not making that mistake again. Liz comes to Survivor by way of her daughter, who encouraged her to apply. As a child, Liz was mute until the age of seven, and I guess is making up for lost time now. She was an RV blogger who turned her email marketing skills into her own business. She's unapologetically goofy and wants to find her silly shield on Survivor, the Carolyn or Carson to her jam jam. I think on another tribe, Liz would be in trouble, but I totally see her gelling with the majority of the people here, Tevin, Soda, Hunter. I think unlike a lot of personality types like this, Liz knows exactly how she's perceived. She knows she's extra and she knows it's not for everyone, so she wants to try to blend in in the early game. Whether she can do that is another thing entirely, but I think she can. I think in an era where super fans are so obsessed with ticking all the survivor boxes, Liz's strategy of being adaptable and adjusting her strategy depending on where the game is going is good. Overall, Liz is probably most in trouble early on, 
but I think if she finds the right alliance on this tribe, she could be deleting a lot of players right out of the game. Like so many emails. Let's move on to 24-year-old actor Tevin Davis, who I am giving the award for most likely to win the SIA award. Just cut him the check right now. A stage actor who's been watching Survivor with his aunt since he was young, I think he's got a good handle on the game. He grew up in rural Virginia and hadn't been out of the country until flying to Fiji for Survivor. In an era where half the cast grew up privileged and attend Ivy Leagues, I think this is the kind of character and background a lot of fans have been looking for. Tevin is going to be a major fan favorite, he's just so fun. Tevin compares himself to, and I'm also reminded of, Carolyn, just a player who is completely lovably over the top themselves. Anything's possible, but it's hard for me to imagine him going early. He's got that country in him where he'll be able to handle the elements, and I think he'll have easy allies on this tribe in Liz and Soda. I think he'll fulfill that social butterfly tribe cheerleader role well. If he's out early, it's on him. I do think he has this instinct to overplay that he needs to suppress. He's impulsive. He says he might try to go on the journeys, and he wants to lie about being an actor. I just rarely think lying about your occupation is a good idea on Survivor, and I don't know. Stage actor from Goochland, Virginia is not the threat he thinks it is. Still, barring any overplaying, I'd imagine Tevin is in it for the long haul. It's really hard for me to see a win for him, but I could easily see him as an end gamer and one of our main characters of the season. And in three months, he'll probably have 100k from Sia. Next, let's look at 27-year-old special ed teacher Soda Thompson, who I am regretfully awarding too nice for Survivor. She is as sweet as the beverage bearing her name, but I unfortunately see her less as a Coca-Cola and more of a Pepsi Blue. Soda came from a dysfunctional household. Her parents battled addiction and her father wasn't in her life, so from a young age, she was kind of on her own. It sounds like that upbringing informed her decision to pursue special education. There's no question that Soda's a giver. If you spend five seconds listening to her talk, it's clear what a great heart she has. Soda's strength is her personality, and keeping morale up goes a long way in Survivor. I think if she can just find her group and be herself, she could be good. But I do worry that she's going to be too trusting and too giving to focus on her own game. It could bite her earlier than later. I just very easily see a scenario where she's like a Survivor 42 Mariah and doesn't have the heart to fight hard for her game and really kick people under the bus when her back is against the wall. Maybe this is why she chose Survivor 42 as the player she'll play most like. More than any other time since I've been doing these cast assessments, I want to be wrong here. Soda is such a warm presence and full of humor and heart. She is an ice-cold glass bottle of Coca-Cola on a hot summer's day. I'd hate to see her fizzle out like Crystal Pepsi. Let's move on to Venus Vafa, a 24-year-old data analyst and our resident Canadian, and most likely to have the best confessionals. Venus is a data analyst now, but she's hoping to pivot to immigration law. As the daughter of Iranian immigrants, she knows firsthand how difficult that process is. She comes to Survivor by way of Netflix, but didn't start with the Netflix seasons. She instead went back to season one and started from the beginning. Respect. There's this witty flippancy to many of her interview responses that are just really funny and which call to mind villains like Courtney Yates and Natalie Bolton. Here's what I like about Venus. These long form interviews are long. People are asked something as simple and fluffy as what fictional character would you want to come visit you? And some of these people give paragraphs worth of answers. Venus just says The Rock. Next. She has this curt directness that is really refreshing. And I think with her, once you get past her mean girl exterior, there's a good ally who will be honest with you, perhaps brutally so. But will she make it far? I could see it going either way. She's got this cold exterior she's going to have to overcome. And she's the smallest person on this season, so if this tribe is regularly going to tribal, she could just get the boot as a perceived challenge liability. 
The good news for her is she's aware of her shortcomings, so there's reason to be optimistic, but that early game is going to be dangerous for her. I think if she can just make it past a couple tribal councils, or better yet, avoid them entirely, she can go far. That said, I think she'll likely talk a bigger game than she'll walk. She's got these big plans for idols and advantages, and I just get the sense she'll be a more conservative player than she's letting on. Probably not the most exciting game to watch, but the confessionals will be good. My winner pick for Survivor 46 is 27-year-old chemistry teacher Hunter McKnight. It's genuinely hard to see a single red flag for Hunter. Physical, but not too physical. A student of the game, but not overtly threatening. Charming, but not overbearing. Hunter just seems like he was built in a lab to be the perfect new era survivor player. This is going to sound like a bit of an odd comparison, but he kind of reminds me of Malcolm, and that he's exceptionally well-rounded and would basically always make the merge on any first-time season. Here's why. Hunter is a teacher at a Christian school in rural Mississippi for underserved children, and he actually hosts his own version of Survivor there for the kids. He's got the discipline to say he doesn't want to go on journeys or get advantages early, because he says in the new era, half the time they're more curse than blessing. He trusts in his own social game. He really seems able to find those little random things he can connect with others on, but also the little things he can use to kick others under the bus. I do think his game will land more on the quieter, less flashy side of things. I'm kind of thinking a Tommy-style game where he's the center of a larger alliance with one or two super tight allies. But hey, at least he'll have charisma. Overall, it's just hard for me to envision a bad turnout for Hunter. He's a guy who 99 times out of 100 makes the merge. He'll have great chemistry with his tribe, and he's gonna win. Survivor 46. Got nothing else for ya. What do you think? Am I right on or way off? Who are you rooting for? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, don't get idled out.